do my best here. And uh, plus, plus, I'm going to be followed by Stephen Greer. So this is a pretty uh, interesting uh, sandwich here I'm in. Uh, but the, the, the theme of this year's gathering has been uh, our uh, becoming uh, citizens, basically, of the galactic neighborhood. Uh, I have focused very uh, specifically on that concept. When, when you start thinking about becoming citizens of some much larger community, you immediately begin to start to realize that there are certain types of uh, community theories and uh, ways to organize our community, the, the classic Greek models of how you organize the, the polis or the, the public uh, into making collective decisions for themselves. But many of us haven't really started to think about that yet. You hear discussions about a potential galactic federation in certain hierarchies uh, within the universe and in the, the beginning of wondering on the part of our species as to exactly where we fit in in this larger model. I have come to the, uh, to the discussion of this, as, uh, as Jan pointed out uh, briefly in the opening remarks, uh, as a, through a long series of major litigations here in our country uh, that have involved major public policy uh, issues and major political constituencies within the United States. I've represented the, uh, the public interest community that was extremely concerned about the development of nuclear power and the potential contamination of our, our groundwater and air by the uh, release of uh, nuclear effluents into the, into the environment, both in Oklahoma and at Three Mile Island, that uh, we obtained the federal court order that stopped the Nuclear Regulatory Commission from pumping radioactive materials out of the uh, damaged facility into the Susquehanna River which they were planning to do. Uh, the, but it was necessary to bring the community there together to move in unison in a particular way to accept a certain positions with regard to litigating against the government. A lot of people didn't want to be confrontational to the government. They wanted to have discussions with the government and cooperate with them and, and get them in good faith to not pump the, the radioactive material into the river. And we had to work many hours with people in the community, the fire chief, the head of the local PTA, and others, to get them all into a common agreement as to how to pursue this particular policy problem. Same thing was true with the issue of, uh, of nuclear power in Oklahoma. And many people in Oklahoma were, were very, very adamantly conservative people that were very much in favor of uh, the, the Kerr-McGee Nuclear Corporation. It was one of the major petroleum uh, producing uh, companies in Oklahoma, and they were a mainstay in Oklahoma. So the, the idea of, of the community actually supporting any type of litigation suing the Kerr-McGee Nuclear Corporation, where a lot of them worked, was a very difficult thing for people to, to come to grips with. So we had to work in a, in a setting with the community for a while to get people to understand how this could be a very constructive undertaking in that particular case by going to litigation. And, and I've, I've been asked to help in a number of different public interest communities uh, over the years. And now, from the time that uh, I uh, was asked by, by the friends of Dr. John Mack to assist him in dealing with the Harvard faculty over this extraordinary issue of the, uh, the UFO encounters that individuals were having, I've been brought into more and more discussions where members of this particular public interest constituency that are interested in the issue of the UFO phenomenon and the uh, phenomena of extraterrestrial intelligence have, uh, have begun to have discussions as to how we might all come to some sort of sense of common agreement and community to be able to effectively address some of these questions that have been within our culture over the last 55 years. Uh, it's in, it's in this context that I come before you today to try to share with you some of the, uh, the insights that we have developed over the years in these other public interest communities and how these might be available to us in this community to guide us in our work together over the next several years. I had uh, been retained by the Gorbachev Foundation uh, to uh, become the director of the State of the World Forums 
uh, search for a, a new paradigm. Uh, given the conclusion of the Cold War, uh, a, a very intense discussion began. Uh, now, this, the, it, this may sound a little bit abstract and, and academic, but it's, but it's not. That in 1989, uh, while the Soviet Union was still very, very much an active power in the world, uh, a professor at the University of Chicago, uh, uh, Stanton Friedman's uh, uh, college, university, uh, one of the professors there, Francis Fukuyama, wrote a major national article uh, call, called The End of History. And he, in that article, uh, in 1989, predicted that the Soviet Union was getting ready to collapse in the very near future. Uh, much sooner than any of the so-called experts uh, in the Western world had predicted. And he asserted that when that moment came, which was going to be coming much more rapidly than anyone expected, the Western world was going to be faced with a major dilemma. While on the one hand they'd be celebrating the final demise of communism, they would suddenly find themselves confronted by the situation that they no longer had an enemy on whom to blame the failures of Western civilization to bring the full benefits of Western civilization's values to the rest of the planet. And given that uh, possibility, he suggested in 1989 that the major political, economic, academic, and cultural leaders of Western civilization gather together self-consciously to attempt to identify the basic values and premises of Western civilization in preparation for bringing these concrete values to the world in this short window of opportunity that would open immediately at the end of the Cold War when the rest of the world might be open to recommendations on the part of the West as to how we might organize a new, more peaceful, global civilization. Uh, now, most people didn't listen to him at the time he had, had done this in 1989, simply because they didn't believe it. They believed that the Soviet Union was definitely going to uh, be around for co some considerable amount of time in the future. But within 30 months of him having written that article in 1989, in December of 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed precipitously into the shock of everyone in the West. And just as Dr. Fukuyama had predicted, it left the leaders of Western civilization unprepared to actually respond to this new window of opportunity. Now, into this vacuum that was created, immediately stepped the most vocal advocates of the classic worldviews of conservatism and liberalism. Now, uh, the liberal camp was, was led by uh, by uh, Dr. Zbigniew Brzezinski, who, as you may recall, was the national security advisor to the liberal administration, the Democratic Party administration of President Jimmy Carter from 1976 to 1980. The conservatives in this dialogue were led by Dr. Samuel Huntington. Samuel P. Huntington is the very conservative uh, Oland Institute professor of international uh, relations at Harvard University and also the president of the American Association of Political Science. And he's also the, uh, the spokesperson for the very conservative uh, Trilateral Commission Council on Foreign Relations. These two men began to engage in this major debate uh, as to which of these two basic alternative value systems ought to be adopted by the leaders of Western civilization to be the driver, the new organizing principle for a new global civilization under the leadership of Western civilization. In the face of this two-way dialogue going on between the liberals and the conservatives, a, a group of world leaders gathered together and began to ask the question as to whether or not there wasn't some possible third option to this liberal conservative debate that was going on. And under the auspices of uh, former Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev, 
and Democratic United States Senator Alan Cranston. And Republican administration, former Secretary of State James Baker and George Shultz, uh, a coalition of world leaders came together to establish an organization, a set of meetings called the State of the World Forum. Now, f over a five-year period from 1995 to the year 2000, annual conferences were held in which from one to 2,000 major world leaders, former presidents, secretaries of state, uh, their heads of the Department of Interior, the uh, major business leaders and academic leaders from around the world gathered together at the Fairmont Hotel in San Francisco uh, each uh, October. Uh, the Fairmont is the location of the founding of the United Nations in 1945. And in honor of, of that, the, they gathered at this place each year uh, to have these sets of discussions. And the effort was, was in an attempt to identify some genuinely new alternative worldview, an alternative paradigm, if you will, to the classic liberal and conservative worldview as an option that could be tendered to the people of the world at the end of the Cold War. Now, I was, I was privileged to be asked to be the director of this particular project, the strategic initiative, to identify the new paradigm. Uh, and in the context of that, I began to share with them uh, a, uh, what, what I, I think to be a, is an extraordinarily important uh, secret that most people don't ever have any real occasion to have to discover. And that was this, that uh, after I'd been out in the field litigating for a number of years and had been legal counsel for the New York Times and the Pentagon Papers case and had been uh, you know, counsel for the American Civil Liberties Union at Wounded Knee and had been uh, legal counsel at, at, at F. Lee Bailey's office, uh, the office that got uh, James McCord, the Watergate burglar, to write the letter to Judge Sirica blowing the whistle on the, uh, the, the plumbers and the Watergate burglars. Uh, it came, became clear to me in my discussions with attorney Lee Bailey that he and I were approaching things from two very, very different perspectives. Uh, that I had, during my spring vacation, uh, when I was working with Bailey, uh, I had gone out to Wounded Knee and had actually uh, participated in negotiating uh, between the FBI and the American Indian Movement to get medical supplies brought into the siege where some people had been hurt. And when I came back to the office, uh, Lee called me on the telephone and said, Dan, come on in here. So I came in and he said, I understand that you've been out at Wounded Knee over the vacation. I said, yes, yes, that's right. And he said, well, which side were you on? <laughs> and I said, well, actually, I w wasn't on either side. I was actually participating with the FBI and the American Indian Movement to negotiate how we would get these medical supplies put in and stuff. And he said, well, gee, Dan, he said, you look at if you'd been on the side of the Justice Department, you could have earned some goodwill for our office. And then we might have made some contacts in the Justice Department and we could negotiate with them to help cut a better deal for one of our clients. You know, like the Angelo brothers or, or some of these <laughs> criminals that, that, that he represented. Uh, it, it was perfectly clear that there was something wrong here. There was some lack of communication going on, that he wasn't getting something. Uh, and that following Sunday morning, I happened to be you know, walking around in Boston and going into bookstores and I found a copy of uh, uh, the, a, a brand new book that had just come out. Uh, Professor John Rawls, the chairman of the Department of Philosophy at Harvard University, had just written a major book called The Theory of Justice. And in this book, he attempted to explore the values of Western civilization and he had come to determine that there was functioning within Western civilization a very strange group of people uh, were not like everybody else, that didn't function like the normal self-interested utilitarian uh, uh, sort of John Stuart Mill philosophy of Western civilization. He called this other group the, the intuitive school of justice. People who would say things that, that all men are created equal uh, and they're created by their uh, in creator with certain inalienable rights and they would go on and on, uh, waxing on about these, these natural law principles, et cetera. And it became perfectly clear to me that John Rawls 
while he recognized the existence of this particular group in Western civilization, had no real idea what they were talking about. He couldn't really understand exactly what it was they were talking about. It, it occurred to me that uh, I might possibly uh, be part of this school, of, of this uh, intuitive school of justice, something that caused me to basically throw up when I got introduced to the Angelo brothers, rather than to try to figure out how to help them. Uh, and and so, so I, I set up a meeting with, with Dr. Rawls and went over and had a, had a long meeting with him. And uh, we ended up discussing this subject for some three and a half hours. And he persuaded me, that now that I'd already graduated from Harvard College and Harvard Law School and was out practicing, to come back to the, to the Harvard University to work on a major PhD thesis, attempting to analyze the nature of natural law justice in Western civilization. And it was in the context of pursuing my master's in, in PhD work uh, in this that I discovered uh, a, a, this very important secret, which I want to share with you, and that I shared with the Gorbachev Foundation and the State of the World Forum and the major world leaders to attempt to design a set of tools that will enable us to, I think, be helpful for trying to understand why it is that people have such a different opinion about this issue of the UFO phenomenon and the issue of extraterrestrial intelligence. That, that most of us in this particular room uh, tend to have a very similar type of response to, the, to this phenomenon. But there's other people who have a completely different reaction. And there are, of course, even within this room, people who have some significantly different perspectives on what this phenomenon is, uh, an issue that has not gone unnoticed in the UFO community over the past uh, 35 or 40 years. And so what, what I want to do is to share with you this discovery that I learned when, when I ended up in, in, the, in the master's program uh, at, at Harvard. What, what we discovered under the studying uh, of uh, ethics, comparative social ethics, uh, Dr. Ralph Potter, who is the chairperson of the Department of Social Ethics at Harvard University, shared with us a great insight that was come to by uh, Dr. Talcott Parsons, who had been the, the chairperson of the Department of Sociology at Harvard University for some 50 years almost. What he discovered is that when you're dealing with any issue of public policy, within the human family, where you're trying to decide which of an alternative number of potential public policy solutions you would like to choose to address a particular public policy problem, you will find that our human family divides ourselves into some seven totally distinct worldviews. So that when you present a given set of data to people, they will come up with seven different ways to solve the problem. The problem is that they're not consistent with each other. Some of them are, in fact, diametrically opposed to each other. And this great mystery began to uh, interest uh, a lot of the scholars in the area of social ethics, and they attempted to begin to study this particular sociological phenomenon. And what they discovered was that our human family has a tendency, each one of us, to gravitate toward the adoption of one or another of these major seven separate and distinct worldviews. And no matter how much information is given to a person about a particular public policy problem, it doesn't change their opinion. That, for example, what, what I experienced in Washington over the, the, uh, the Iran-Contra issue, the whole issue of whether or not the United States under the Reagan and Bush administration were smuggling weapons to the Contras, the former National Guard uh, of, of uh, Samosa down in Nicaragua, to attempt to militarily overthrow the Sandinista government down there, became a great subject of debate in, in Washington uh, in the early years of the Reagan-Bush administration. But no matter how much data you attempted to bring to any one of the Congress people or any of the people that were involved in this discussion, that you couldn't, you couldn't change their mind about this. 
And so uh, I, was, I was reminded of Dr. Potter's admonition that in fact, when you're, when you're dealing with a major public policy issue, you're going to discover this problem every single time unless you address the fundamental predicates of a person's worldview. Simple data about the particular subject matter you're discussing isn't going to change their mind. So I wanted to share with you, as I did with the leaders of the Gorbachev Foundation and with the, the major leaders of the world in our, our paradigm discussions, what this great secret really is. What, what they have discovered is that these, these seven specific identifiable distinct worldviews are, rela are, are related to, there's four basic pillars that undergird a completely distinct and unique worldview. And I want to touch upon them with you briefly so that we can apply them into this area and that we can help ourselves solve this, this problem of differing perspectives. Let me, let me give you a, a graphic uh, demonstration of what I, what I mean by this, for example. That I, I just talked about this afternoon at lunch with some of our speakers, but that, that you take a classic situation where you have three beakers of water. And in the beaker on the right-hand side, you have water that's about 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And then over on your left, you have a beaker of water that's approximately 110 degrees Fahrenheit. And then you have a beaker in the middle, which is room temperature water. And you take your hand and you stick it in the beaker on your right, and you let it stay in there for a long time into this 40 degree water. And you take it out and you put it into the beaker of room temperature water, and the water feels genuinely warm. And you have your right hand in the beaker, uh, the other hand in the beaker of, of hot water at 110 degrees, and you leave it in there for a long time. You take it out and you put it into the room temperature water, the beaker of water, and it feels genuinely cold. And the fact of the matter is, if you keep both your hands in those other water and you put them both into the same water at the exact same time, your left hand will feel hot and your right hand will feel cold. And so the, the fact of the matter is you're, you're actually experiencing the exact same phenomenon. But the subjective experience that you're having is completely different, predicated upon where your hand came from. So in that same way, depending upon which of these several different worldviews you come from when you encounter the UFO experience, you are going to have a subjective experience of that phenomenon, which is very much rooted in where it is you're coming from. And so that's, that's the example, that, that's, that's why it's so important for us to understand this, this science of social ethics, if we're going to really be able to figure out how to solve this problem. Now that the issues, the issues, the four pillars that go into defining a generic worldview that is separate and distinct from each of the other seven worldviews. The first category of, of belief for one of these four pillars is your cosmology. Now, most people, you wouldn't think of it. If you're going to sit down and talk about gun control or birth control or abortion or women's rights or black civil rights uh, or the military budget, you wouldn't normally assume that you were going to have to talk with someone about their cosmology. But it turns out that it would be a much more constructive conversation than trying to talk with them about debating about how many independent targetable MERV warheads there ought to be on an Atlas missile. Because you can have those kind of conversations with a person all day long and it'll never change their mind. But if, in fact, you can dialogue with them about the, the suppositions that they bring to their cosmology, you can actually possibly alter their worldview. Now, the cosmology, the, the conversation that, that, was, that Eric Davis had with us this morning was a classic cosmological discussion. It has to do with what you think the kind of physical laws are pursuant to which our universe came into physical being, pursuant to which it is presently maintained, 
and pursuant to which we believe it will continue to function forever into the future. That particular set of beliefs that you hold constitutes your cosmology. And, and I want to, and I'll, I'll share with you the, each of the other three major pillars, but I want to I just briefly talk about the cosmology so you can see how it spreads across the spectrum of these seven totally distinctive worldviews. You start out on the, on the one end of the spectrum, and you, can, you start out with a first paradigm worldview. A first paradigm worldview is rooted primarily in our human instinct to survive as an individual organism. And this is uh, centered in the root chakra of the energy system of the human body, rooted specifically in a survival motivation, a, a fundamental root instinct of the individual human being. And pursuant to this, this first paradigm worldview, that the, the cosmology that is adhered to in this first worldview is one pursuant to which they believe that the entire physical universe is made up of a finite, limited, and set number of ultimately irreducible integers of matter. And it doesn't make any difference whether this is a, an atom, or an electron, or a, a quark, or a neutrino, or a meson, or even ultimately an inchoate quantum field that has both qualities of a particle and a wavelength. But that whatever, whatever the ultimately irreducible integer of matter is, that it is the fundamental building block of the entire physical universe. And that there are a finite and fixed number of these. And very importantly, all matter in the universe, pursuant to this first paradigm worldview cosmology, all matter is disintegrating in the universe. It is disintegrating at a rate pursuant to its rate of atomic breakdown, and it's breaking down into the constituent irreducible integers of matter. And at the same time, the entire universe is expanding out and away from the locus of the original Big Bang, and so that everything is spreading out and away from the locus of the Big Bang, and all matter is disintegrating into its constituent element parts. And there will come a point in time, pursuant to the first paradigm cosmology, at which every single ultimately irreducible integer of matter in the entire universe will stand separate and apart from every other such unit. And at that point in time, it will continue to expand out and away from each other to the point where the universe will disintegrate through a process known as entropy to the point where no thing will exist. Now, that's a bummer. <laughs> that's a bummer worldview. But it's rooted on, out of this instinctive terror of a fear that all there is is chaos all around you and that you are threatened from every direction. As, a, as an individual organism, you're constantly threatened with somehow being put out of separate existence. And therefore, your, your driving motive from this cosmology is to survive. And that cosmology will determine a, a very special type of worldview. Now, a, the second paradigm worldview is a worldview that is very similar, except that adherence to the second paradigm worldview, their cosmology is one which when in fact that moment is reached, when every ultimately irreducible integer of matter in the entire physical universe stands separate and apart from every other one, the impetus that had been imposed upon them from the initial Big Bang that had caused them to be expanding out and away from each other and disintegrating in that manner will have been spent. And at that point, the bonding attraction that every single ultimately irreducible integer of matter in the entire physical universe has for every other one in the physical universe will then be superior. And at the very next microsecond, it will begin to collapse back in upon itself. And it will then begin to reorganize neutrinos and quarks and mesons and in electrons, and in, in, in back into planets, and solar systems, and galaxies, 
etc., and will continue to collapse back in upon each other all the way up unto the point where every single solitary, ultimately irreducible integer of matter in the entire physical cosmos is in direct physical contact with every other one. Such that the entire matter of the entire physical universe will be smaller than the size of the head of a pin. Now you've all heard that. You've all heard it at, at, at one time or another and say, that's really far out. <laughs> but, uh, but the fact of the matter is that those who believe that believe that at the very next microsecond after coming to direct physical contact with each other, every single one, the polarity of every single ultimately irreducible integer of matter will instantaneously reverse itself and push away from every other one, thus recreating the Big Bang once again, which will go through that entire process once again. And that what you get is an oscillating cosmos that is beating just like a heartbeat, eternally, in that manner. And more pointedly, it in fact repeats itself over and over and over again. This is in Einstein's dreams, if you've read the book about how the things keep replaying each other over and over and over again. It is a very specific cosmological worldview. And these people, I remember spending one entire day with Marlon Brando with his house up in, in Mulholland Drive of him going, pulling his hair out and feeling terrible because that's what he believes. And it's just it's a big bummer. You know, so he, he can find great motivation for playing an apocalypse now, you know, and, uh, but, but that's what he thinks. And there, there are all kinds of other people who believe that particular thing. And so that there's it's predestination. You've heard the long theological discourse. It's about predestination, that everything is predestined. If you can only figure out what the vector of forces are on every single ultimately irreducible integer of matter at the very beginning of the Big Bang, you can predict every single thing that's going to be happening because it's purely a function of mechanics and laws of mechanics. And this is what they believe. Now, that also will generate a certain uh, inevitability of worldview, but very importantly, what it generates is a dialectical worldview. That there is, a, there is this expansion and contraction going on. There is a dialectical worldview in which there is a, a, an I and, a, and a, a you and a me, and an us and a them that there is an ultimate experience of, of, of conflict, of, a, of an oscillation between an A and a B. And this is the major driving dynamic. The, the one is for individuated survival in the first worldview paradigm by the cosmology. The second one is one of dialectical conflict, is that the whole meaning, the only meaning, in fact, that exists to anything is, in fact, taken from the dialectic. It is the only means by which you can ever determine anything. It gets into one of the other pillars of, of, a, of a worldview, which is your mode of ethical reasoning, which we'll touch on. But this second worldview, this cosmology, is fundamentally different. And you get to the third worldview, the third paradigm worldview, and here for the first time you have this extraordinary phenomenon of mind arises. Consciousness somehow is perceived as arising up out of matter. Make no mistake about it, pursuant to the third worldview cosmology, consciousness, consciousness is a function of the interaction of matter, of the interaction of these ultimately irreducible integers of matter somehow generate consciousness, that we are in fact a result of the simple mere physical mechanical interplay of irreducible integers of matter in the universe. And this unique consciousness that we perceive ourselves as experiencing is in fact simply a function of matter. But what distinguishes the third worldview from the second and first worldview is that they believe that this experience of mind enables us to have a place of perspective from which we can oversee the otherwise simple chaotic disintegration of the universe or the simple repetitive bipolar <laughs> expansion and contraction of matter in a mindless mechanical manner, now for the first time there is a phenomenon of mind from the perspective of which we can act to intercede into the otherwise simple chaotic dissolution of the universe or in its otherwise simple mechanical repetitive means of, of acting. And this is the role of mind. Kant talks about it at great length uh, at others. The difficulty of the third 
paradigm worldview in this cosmology is that they don't believe there's any way pursuant to which your consciousness can get unconditioned from its material context. And so therefore there's no place from which you can get an independent perspective from which to make choices about how to guide your action <laughs> and choices. And this is therefore you're going to have to just make a courageous assertion of simple will knowing that it's fundamentally conditioned by your material state of being and therefore you have to make an existential choice and be courageous to make an existential choice knowing that it does not draw upon any ultimate insight into absolute reality but you make your existential choice and you assert it and it becomes real in, the, in altering the otherwise mechanical play of the universe. This just gives you some example of how fundamental these ideas are in Western civilization. And if you come to understand that this cosmology plays itself out, there are alternative cosmological visions for the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh paradigms. I'll just touch on that. The seventh paradigm, for example, at the other end of the spectrum, believes that in fact there is an infinite and eternal undifferentiated sea of consciousness. Now that's undifferentiated consciousness which abides eternally and infinitely. And that it is out of that infinite eternal sea of undifferentiated consciousness that the first integer, pre-integer of matter in the universe is enfolded into being. And that sets up a perturbation within the infinite uniform field to generate the initial unit of matter which sets up additional perturbations which generate additional matter and it fr is from this point that matter is generated into being in the universe. That is what they call the emanish, emanationist theory of physical reality. Now it shouldn't surprise anyone that when you begin to talk about an infinite and eternal sea of undifferentiated <laughs> consciousness as being the origin of all material being that you're into the realm of theology. And this is the ultimate deist worldview. And there are others in between. Now, the, the fact of the matter is that, that this cosmology is one of the four pillars of a, of a discrete worldview. The second of the four pillars is what they call epistemology. Now, epistemology is one of these big fancy words that people always use when they want to impress you and make them think that you're smarter than they are. Uh, but, but the fact of the matter is, uh, all epistemology means is that it is, the, it is the study of what human beings believe the means are that are at our disposal by means of which we can access reality. For example, that some people believe that, that anything that's real, you have to be able to see it, touch it, taste it, smell it, hear it that it's got to be subject to your five senses, that once you can get something subject to your five senses and you can measure it or weigh it or see it or smell it or taste it or feel it, that then it exists. But things that lie beyond our five senses therefore don't exist. And they're, therefore the epistemology of the first, the first paradigm, for you know, the first paradigm uh, epistemology is one of simple raw materialism that exists in a three-dimensional reality that can be subjected to your own five senses and can be measured and tasted and felt, etc. And that that's all that exists. Now, th what you will discover, and I just want to just want to share it with you, so that that you can discuss it whenever you want it, uh, with your children and, and others, is that the the under this uh, the epistemological difference, there is a is a sense that there is some other faculty that the, our human species is evolving, that is supplemental to the five senses of sight and hearing and taste and touch, etc. And this is the big discussion about the sixth sense. This is the big discussion about intuition, that there is some faculty that is evolving in the human species over time that in, will enable us as members of the human species to directly, experientially encounter 
In the same way that we see light, the electromagnetic phenomenon of light, which has its own pitch and its own amplitude, and in the same way that we can directly experience the physical phenomenon of sound, which has its own particular pitch and amplitude. That there is an additional faculty evolving in the human species, pursuant to which we are able to directly experientially encounter the phenomenon that bonds every ultimately irreducible integer of matter in the entire physical universe into direct harmonious whole with every other. And that therefore, pursuant to the exercise of that faculty, we are able to experientially discern what type of human conduct, individual or collective, is either harmonious with or disharmonious to the natural order of being. This, of course, is the master identifier of the sixth paradigm. This is what the people are talking about when they're talking about the new paradigm. That we want to find a new paradigm and that it's, it's intuitive and it's based upon a sixth sense. It's knowledgeable that everything is all unified and harmonious and that it's all subject to our own, our own access through this faculty of, of the intuition. Now, therefore, the epistemological pillar of any given one of these seven paradigms is differentiated from each other by the degree to which they recognize the centrality of the role of this faculty within the human species to the point where the sixth paradigm recognizes it as ultimately central to the defining nature of us as unique beings in the universe. Now, the third of the four pillars of, of these, of a unique, distinct paradigm, is the teleology. Teleology is another one of those big words. All it really means is that, you know, what is one's theory about the role of the human species within this unfolding cosmology? Now, obviously, there are writers like Daniel Denton and others in the first paradigm worldview that believe that the human species is just completely accidental, random event. The random interplay of mass and energy that happens to have generated us and that we just have this big, this big homocentric bias and that, uh, that we're just an accident of nature and uh, that's all there is to it, but we get carried away with our own self-importance. And that uh, that's the first paradigm worldview. And it goes on up from there to the point where ultimately in the, in the seventh paradigm, our, the, the adherence to the seventh paradigm believe that our human species is absolutely, totally unique in the entire created order because we exist at the very apex of the biological evolution of matter up into consciousness. And that not only that, but that we in fact are the very vehicle by means of which the universe shall be salvaged from the fall of the Lutheran temptation that, uh, that, that, uh, uh, Lucifer, that Lucifer basically fell at some time in some realm, in some dimension, some mythological time and place, and that that failure can be redeemed by the human species through the exercise of our faculty of the spirit. Now, these are, as, as you would suspect, these are extraordinarily profound issues. These are issues of a profundity that you might not anticipate having to think about coming to a conference like this. But the fact of the matter is, you know perfectly well when you're coming to a conference and you listen to a guy like Eric talk and deliver a three and a half hour lecture to you in one hour and 15 minutes. <laughs> uh, that, that in fact, that every single thing that you were listening to just set lights off and going, woo, wow, whoa, whoosh. And it, but the fact is you ought to begin to suspect from a conversation like that that a conversation like this should follow after it. 
because this these these are the these are the fundamental issues that you need to talk about and to think about if we are going to be able to share the awe in wonder and in extraordinary excitement that we have about this issue that brings us all here this weekend together out of all the myriad of things that we could be doing this weekend and virtually everyone else is <laughs> You know, if I mean that you, you can you can talk about these things because these touch upon these touch upon where people live, these touch upon people's daily lives. This this doesn't come down out of the sky at night and walk through your wall and bonk you in the middle of the night and take you into a spaceship somewhere and and, and transport you. This is something that doesn't frighten people quite so much. The, this is where the realm of the ultimate touches, touches the lives of people. This, this is that realm. And the fourth of these pillars, in addition to cosmology, epistemology, or the theory of the role of the human species in the cosmos, uh, their teleology, uh, the fourth is the mode of ethical reasoning. Now, the mode of, the mode of ethical reasoning uh, is how you determine what you believe to be good or bad, or whether something is good or bad. Now, each one of these seven different major worldviews has a separate and distinct mode of ethical reasoning. The first, the first paradigm worldview, of course, you could easily guess what that is, is that each individual will decide what choice facing that person faced with a given policy problem, what choice they will make, is that choice which generates the immediate, short-term, highest degree of personal satisfaction to themselves, which maximizes their survival and pleasure principle. And then it works its way on up from there, from that first paradigm to the second paradigm, where one is willing to extend one's moral choice of choosing the, the, the public policy option which in fact generates the, the greatest benefit to you and your immediate family and loved ones. And then the next paradigm goes up to your tribe. And the next paradigm goes up to your nation state. And the next one will go up to your entire continent, often a race. And it continues like that, that the, the extendability of your mode of ethical analysis of who the people are that are included in on the benefits of the choices that you make among alternative public policy options to solve a given or address a given problem is in fact dependent upon your worldview. And so your mode of ethical reasoning is more expansive as you move into different worldviews. Now there are other, other than these four basic pillars, there are additional qualities and characteristics that these separate worldviews have. Uh, and one of them, one of the most obvious of them, is its different mode of spiritual expression. What you will discover is that each of these seven major worldviews has generated a major world religion. Ranging from the first, wor first paradigm worldview, which is a, a, an animist worldview of the classic shamans, of animus that everything is, is filled with, with energy and, and, and there are, are physical laws and rules of magic that can be mastered and transformation and bilocation and all kinds of things going on in those. And the modes of spiritual expression move all the way on up through to, to the ultimate radical monist worldview of the sixth paradigm, the classic, the classic Buddhist worldview of radical monism, not a belief in any deity, but a, a dissolution into the oceanic uh, unity of all being. And then the seventh paradigm is a theistic, a classic theistic uh, spiritual mode of expression pursuant to which on the other side of the ocean of, of oceanic unity of experience, one encounters an I-thou relationship with the infinite, which calls out awe and wonder and submission, Islam. Islam and other theistic worldviews. Now this is just, this is the, the actual chart that has been designed by professional social ethicists 
to lay forth what the range of options are that the human species has before us up until now. <laughs> because at the root of every single one of these seven major recognized human worldviews resides the premise that we are in fact at the apex of all biological evolution in the universe. And that we alone hold this preeminent position. And we are on the very brink within our generation's lifetime of being faced with the realization that that ain't so. And this actually calls back to collective human mind the threat posed by Galileo when Galileo insisted that, that our Earth was not at the geophysical center of the physical cosmos and threatened to take the human species out of the center physically of the universe for which he was imprisoned by the Catholic Church and people were forbidden to read his book under the pain of excommunication. And so therefore, even though our guardians of our world order from 1632 managed to salvage the centrality of our human species, by saying, okay, okay, we'll grant you that we're not in the physical center of the cosmos, but we're still in the metaphysical center <laughs> of the cosmos. We are still that kind of pinnacle of the evolution of consciousness out of matter up into reaching into the infinite realm of consciousness from the realm of matter. Okay? And we are uniquely in that place. That too appears not to be so that we not only may not be the only being at that nexus between matter and consciousness, therefore not being the central player, only central player in the cosmic drama of the unfolding of consciousness into being. But the fact is, given an additional billion years of evolution, other species may in fact be, dare I say it, superior to us <laughs> in this preeminent quality, thereby generating the danger that I'm here to talk about today. Because when faced with such a threat, what is going to be the response of the adherence to the different major human worldviews? One of them is going to arm itself in secret because of its first and second paradigm worldviews in which they hold in disdain the great unwashed masses who are not entitled to be participating in making these types of decisions. And they shall arm themselves in a way in the second paradigm to set up a dialectical confrontational military relationship with this extraterrestrial civilization. But there are others who have plighted their troth of their particular worldview with the premise that we are the sole and superior being in the universe at the nexus of consciousness and matter. If, in fact, they are to discover that there is another set of beings who are, in fact, superior to us in that unique realm, will immediately throw themselves down in awe and prostration before such beings and consider ourselves unqualified to deal with them as equals and as peers. And make no mistake about the tendency that our human family has had for many thousands of years to do that. Kings and queens still reign in our world as we sit here today. And so the the dual danger that I've come before you to talk about today is not that we shall in fact continue as the, the community has of debating and arguing about the various different interpretations that can be given to this phenomenon. That some of us believe that these are extra, the UFO phenomenon are extraterrestrial vehicles, material vehicles 
uh, that manifest in our physical reality uh, of beings from another physical planet who have just simply mastered the speed of light. Others who, in fact, maintain that, no, no, these are secret uh, U.S. government uh, instrumentalities that have been designed uh, based upon research by Tesla and, uh, and maybe even the Germans, uh, you know, fr from the end of World War II. Uh, and others who, in fact, believe that these are extra-dimensional beings that we've somehow been able to tunnel through into another contiguous dimension. Uh, others who will think that these are, in fact, the, the function of just psyops that there's some super secret national security black ops program that has in fact developed some sort of super uh, equipment that can in fact project onto you these kind of terrifying experiences. And others who believe that these are a genuine spiritual phenomenon of some sort, uh, manifested in the, what we think are kind of scientific terms. We've tried to scientificize our own theological ruminations. Uh, and then lastly, uh, that these, uh, that these, uh, this UFO phenomenon is perhaps some kind of photoplasmic projection out into almost physical reality of a collective unconscious, a Jungian archetypal unconscious fear that we have about our potential future. That we may in fact fall prey to our own ecological disaster or nuclear disaster or genetic engineering disaster in that that uh, this is some archetypal fear that we have and that we're projecting into photoplasmic manifestations. Or, finally, that these may even be us in the future coming back to warn us of what to avoid ecologically from the area of nuclear power and weapons and from genetic engineering. Do not make these mistakes. The fact that different people have different points of view on this, as I've pointed out, uh, appear very possibly to be a function of the different worldviews that we come from. But the simple fact is that we are faced this year, in the year 2001, with what I think is primarily a dual threat. That our human civilization is going to be inclined to respond primarily in one of two ways to this phenomenon. One is to secretly arm some secret black operations and through back engineering of their technology and the development of pulse weapons and golden pebbles and, and super secret weapon systems to try to put up a satellite system that is helping them in militarily assault these UFO vehicles under the guise of protecting ourselves against some, quote, rogue nations launching a missile or two at us. You know, as if, as if these countries are going to be spending billions of dollars, you know, uh, to build a, a major nuclear missile delivery system, when in fact they can put them in a backpack and bring them in on the subway. <laughs> you know, and the, the the top fourteen, the top fourteen, the top the top fourteen military generals in the United States Pentagon are trying to tell the Congress this is ridiculous to be spending billions of dollars on a, on a Star Wars system like this when the primary threats we have to protect ourselves against, they can, they can deliver these same things in three other ways that don't require that at all. And therefore, they jump up and down and say, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? You know? So, so what I'm saying is that that's one of the two basic ways in which members of our human family may respond. The other, as I have said, is to fail to understand and appreciate the full qualities of our human species in the face of a species that is technologically, intellectually, and perhaps, yes, even perhaps spiritually superior to us. How is it that we can discover what it is that entitles us to full and equal partnership, full and equal citizenship in the galactic neighborhood and community? This task, I would suggest, is the task that we need to be all about. We, we need, I believe, we need, I believe, to come together to stop this bickering and attacking and ad hominem set of attacks against each other and to understand that when people attack, say, well, this spectrum that you've laid out of all these different worldviews, does that spectrum move from the left to the right? 
are these left right politics that we're talking about dragging into the UFO community? What I'm suggesting to you is that this is in fact simply a sociological bar graph model that's been designed by the human family independently to just splay out these alternatives before us. It's essential to understand that the basic driving motive of every single one of the seven basic human worldviews is absolutely vital, essential, and necessary for our human survival. In that one is not superior to the other. Every single one of these major energy centers in the human body, every single one of the seven chakra energy centers of the human body, and indeed the eight, needs to be fully understood and appreciated and developed. We are talking about in the new paradigm coming to understand that we need to do a lot more than to develop just the new sixth paradigm of the new quantum field in physics, which is residing in the sixth, the sixth center of our human consciousness. And we need to go beyond even the seventh in the crown chakra that opens us on to utopian theistic insight. There is, in fact, an eighth chakra of being in the human species. This, this device that we are, this evolved being that we stand as, at the gates of the universe, is an astonishing and extraordinary experience of being. And that we need to come to understand in full what this mechanism is that we have been endowed with and learn how to master it, to learn to master the energies of each and every one of these seven major energy centers and the eighth of our human being. Not to denigrate any single one of them, not to become left or right or a radical centrist, but to understand that the ability to develop every one of these in equal measure will in fact entitle us ultimately to equal citizenship in our galactic neighborhood and community. And that's what I call upon us to begin the discussion today. Thank you very much. Eric Von Denigan's hypothesis will have an increasing effect on society, science, literature, and art. The search for extraterrestrial intelligence is a concern that affects all of humanity. For me, it's like souvenirs of the past. Some of our human forefathers had contact with extraterrestrials. They were here, they visited us, they were in contact. Something happened in the deep past and it will happen again in the future. Author of the sensational international bestseller and the most compelling non-fiction publication of all time is back in London for the first time in 25 years to celebrate Chariots of the Gods 50th anniversary. Eric Von Denigan Legacy Night. In this two-hour special, you are invited to share with Eric his most influential discoveries and revelations. Learn about his incredible life journey as an author and researcher. Meet the team behind the highly anticipated Chariots of the Gods 360-degree entertainment franchise. Eric Von Denigan Legacy Night, live streamed from the Princess Anne Theatre, BAFTA 195, Piccadilly, London, October 15, 2016. For more information and to purchase tickets, please visit ZoharStargate.com. as to how we might organize a new, more peaceful, global civilization. Uh, now, most people didn't listen to him at the time he had, had done this in 1989, simply because they didn't believe it. They believed that the Soviet Union was definitely going to uh, be around for co some considerable amount of time in the future. <coughs> but within 30 months of him having written that article in 1989, in December of 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed precipitously into the shock of everyone in the West. And just as Dr. Fukuyama had predicted, it left the leaders of Western civilization unprepared 
to actually respond to this new window of opportunity. Now, into this vacuum that was created, immediately stepped the most vocal advocates of the classic worldviews of conservatism and liberalism. Now, uh, the liberal camp was, was led by, uh, by Dr. Zbigniew Brzezinski, who, as you may recall, was the national security advisor to the liberal administration, the Democratic Party administration of President Jimmy Carter from 1976 to 1980. The conservatives in this dialogue were led by Dr. Samuel Huntington. Samuel P. Huntington is the very conservative uh, Olin Institute professor of international uh, relations at Harvard University and also the president of the American Association of Political Science. And he's also the uh, years. And now, from the time that uh, I uh, was asked by, by the friends of uh, Dr. John Mack to assist him in dealing with the Harvard faculty over this extraordinary issue of the, uh, the UFO encounters that individuals were having. I've been brought into more and more discussions where members of this particular public interest constituency that are interested in the issue of the UFO phenomenon in the uh, phenomena of extraterrestrial intelligence have, uh, have begun to have discussions as to how we might all come to some sort of sense of common agreement and community to be able to effectively address some of these questions that have been within our culture over the last 55 years. Uh, it's, in, it's in this context that I come before you today to try to share with you some of the uh, the insights that we have developed over the years in these other public interest communities and how these might be available to us in this community to guide us in our work together over the next several years. I had uh, been retained by the Gorbachev Foundation uh, to uh, become the director of the State of the World Forum's uh, search for a, a new paradigm. Uh, given the conclusion of the Cold War, uh, a, a very intense discussion began. Uh, now, this, the, this may sound a little bit abstract and, and academic, but it's, but it's not. That in 1989, uh, while the Soviet Union was still very, very much an active power in the world, we were influence into the, into the environment, both in Oklahoma and at Three Mile Island, that uh, we obtained the federal court order that stopped the Nuclear Regulatory Commission from pumping radioactive materials out of the uh, damaged facility into the Susquehanna River, which they were planning to do. Uh, the, but it was necessary to bring the community there together to move in unison in a particular way to accept a certain positions with regard to litigating against the government. A lot of people didn't want to be confrontational to the government. They wanted to have discussions with the government and cooperate with them and and get them in good faith to not pump the, the radioactive material into the river. And we had to work many hours with people in the community, the fire chief, the head of the local PTA, and others, to get them all into a common agreement as to how to pursue this particular policy problem. Same thing was true with the issue of, uh, of nuclear power in Oklahoma. And many people in Oklahoma were, were very, very adamantly conservative people that were very much in favor of uh, the, the Kerr-McGee Nuclear Corporation. It was one of the major petroleum uh, producing uh, companies in Oklahoma. And they were a mainstay in Oklahoma. So the, the idea of, of the community actually supporting any type of litigation suing the Kerr-McGee Nuclear Corporation, where a lot of them worked, was a very difficult thing for people to, to come to grips with. So we had to work in a, in a setting with the community for a while to get people to understand how this could be a very constructive undertaking in that particular case by going to litigation. And, and I've, I've been asked to help in a number of different public interest communities uh, over the years. I'll do my best here. And uh, plus, plus I'm going to be followed by Stephen Greer. So this is a pretty uh, interesting uh, sandwich here I'm in. Uh, but the, the, the theme of this year's gathering has been uh, our uh, becoming uh, citizens, basically, 
of the galactic neighborhood. Uh, I have focused very uh, specifically on that concept. When, when you start thinking about becoming citizens of some much larger community, you immediately begin to start to realize that there are certain types of uh, community theories and uh, ways to organize our community, the, the classic Greek models of how you organize the, the polis or the, the public uh, into making collective decisions for themselves. But many of us haven't really started to think about that yet. You hear discussions about a potential galactic federation in certain hierarchies uh, within the universe and in the, the beginning of wondering on the part of our species as to exactly where we fit in in this larger model. I have come to the, uh, to the discussion of this, as, uh, as Jan pointed out uh, briefly in the opening remarks, uh, as a, through a long series of major litigations here in our country uh, that have involved major public policy uh, issues and major political constituencies within the United States. I've represented the, uh, the public interest community that was extremely concerned about the development of nuclear power and the potential contamination of our, our groundwater and air by the uh, release of uh, nuclear. Uh, a professor at the University of Chicago, uh, uh, Stanton Friedman's uh, uh, college, university, uh, one of the professors there, Francis Fukuyama, wrote a major national article uh, call, called The End of History. And he, in that article, uh, in 1989, predicted that the Soviet Union was getting ready to collapse in the very near future, uh, much sooner than any of the so-called experts uh, in the Western world had predicted. And he asserted that when that moment came, which was going to be coming much more rapidly than anyone expected, the Western world was going to be faced with a major dilemma while on the one hand they'd be celebrating the final demise of communism, they would suddenly find themselves confronted by the situation that they no longer had an enemy on whom to blame the failures of Western civilization to bring the full benefits of Western civilization's values to the rest of the planet. And given that, uh, possibility, he suggested in 1989 that the major political, economic, academic, and cultural leaders of Western civilization gather together self-consciously to attempt to identify the basic values and premises of Western civilization in preparation for bringing these concrete values to the world in this short window of opportunity that would open immediately at the end of the Cold War when the rest of the world might be open to recommendations on the part of the West 